Greetings from the Black Hills of Dakota Territory. United States of America, Stan Jibalisco here, continuing our little tutorial in regards to the book Beginner's Guide to Reading Schematics, published by McGraw Hill, the third edition, in October of 2013. I've expounded on all the advantages of the spiral-bound version as opposed to electronic versions of a book like this because it'll lay flat on your workbench, has no battery, needs no boot up, acquires no bugs nor viruses, and if you spill your Diet Mountain Dew on it all, it'll get, is wet. I would like to refer to you to page 104, figure 5-15. Now, in the previous two videos, I talked about LC filters, low pass and high pass. Well, you can combine those types of circuits and get what is known as a band pass filter. Here's a low-pass filter, C1, L1, combine to form an LC low-pass, pardon me, this is a high-pass high filter right here. That's a high-pass filter, C1 and L1, combined to form a, a high-pass L network filter. L2 and C2, on the other hand, combine to form a low-pass network. Remember, now let's see if I can get this straight in my aging head. Capacitors' impedance go up as the frequency goes down, and their impedance goes down as the frequency goes up. That means capacitors attenuate signals more and more as the frequency goes down. Given a constant input and output impedance, a capacitor will attenuate the signals, that is to say it will suppress them or block them or discriminate against them, more and more as the frequency goes down, whereas an inductor does exactly the opposite. The impedance of an inductor goes up as the frequency goes up and goes down as the frequency goes down. So an inductor will tend to attenuate signals more and more as the frequency goes up and less and less as the frequency goes down. So a series connected capacitor will tend to pass high frequencies. I guess I, another thing about the paper bound type of version of a book is that you can mark on it and uh, to your heart's content really, to your brain's content, a capacitor will tend to favor high frequencies going through it. An inductor will tend to favor low frequencies going through it. So this combination L1 and C1 tend to form a high pass filter because it passes the high frequencies this way and tends to uh, tends to short out the low frequencies this way. So these two conspire to pass high frequencies, whereas this combination right here, the inductor tends to suppress signals more and more as the frequency goes up and let them pass more and more easily as the frequency goes down. This capacitor will short signals out more and more as the frequency goes up and short them out less and less as the frequency goes down so they conspire to form a low pass filter. So if we make the cutoff frequency of this filter. Let's call the cutoff frequency F sub 2. Let's call the cutoff frequency of this combination F sub 1. Remember, this is a high pass filter, so it'll have a response something like that if we graph amplitude on the vertical axis and frequency on the horizontal axis, going increasing to the right increasing going up like that. 
amplitude versus frequency, a high pass filter's response will look like this. Whereas the low pass filter, if we put it on the same graph, frequency on the horizontal axis increasing to the right, amplitude on the vertical axis increasing as we go up, we'll get a response like that. Now if we combine these two in such a way that the high pass uh, cutoff, that's about the midpoint of that transitional part of the curve there, if the high pass cutoff F sub 1 is significantly less than the low pass filter F sub 2, we will get what is known as a band pass response. We will get in effect, let me graph that one on this coordinate system here. You know, it's really amazing. They can send people to the moon, they can make robots crawl around on Mars, but they can't make a decent pencil eraser, and they can't make a mechanical pencil that doesn't keep spitting its lead or its graphite out so that it keeps breaking off. What's up with this, hey? I guess maybe they consider the moon more important than books like schematic diagram instructional manuals. Oh, well, that's life. You get a response to something like that. There's the high pass part, there's the low pass part. Now, you want the high pass response to be at a lower frequency than the, or the high pass cutoff at a lower frequency than the low pass cutoff. Am I getting all that straight? No wonder I have trouble with that. I'll bet other people do, too. There's other stuff I've had trouble with, you know, uh, figuring out the conversion between um, uh, what Ampere turns and Gilberts. I can never get that. And I've even seen um, Internet sites uh, that had it wrong. And I, I'm not going to try and remember now. I think that the... Ampere turn, ampere turn is a bigger unit than the Gilbert, and that's the way that you remember these things, is it's a bigger chunk. But if you were to make the high-pass response, or the high-pass cutoff F sub 1, if you were to make that greater than F sub 2, these two filters would conspire with each other to attenuate everything. You wouldn't get anything at all worth worth uh, bothering about. That would be an example of a bad piece of engineering now, wouldn't it? So F1, the high pass response, you want that to be less, lower frequency than the low pass response. And if you connect them like this, now you can cascade them again and again with the same uh, high pass component values and the same low pass component values. And you'll get a little bit sharper responses, but that only works up to a certain point. All of this said, modern digital signal processing, or DSP, trumps all of this analog technology when it comes to the effectiveness of band pass, low pass, and high pass filters. Digital technology trumps it. So all of this is kind of a meaningless exercise. These signals are, per, uh, these signals, well, these circuits are pretty much obsolete from a practical standpoint, but this book is about reading schematics. I'm down in the nerd cave, and this is my workbench, or actually it's my ham radio operating table. Down in the nerd cave, all dark with a fireplace, and oh my, 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 this is a real cave. Beginner's Guide to Reading Schematics and to Drawing Them, published by McGraw-Hill, October 2013, edited by me. The previous authors are Traster and Lisk, and I'm grateful to them for giving me the foundation to create this book. With that, I will conclude this little tutorial. And think about what the next one's going to be. Until next time, so long.